You're being called. All right. And our next panelist here is Al Byers. Um, and Al, as we said, has been with us on this journey for a long, long time. And when we started these conferences, Al was there. So Al is currently the Assistant Research Professor for STEM Education, the Center for Innovation in STEM Education School of Education, Virginia Commonwealth University. So take it away, Al. Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate it. If you would stand here just for a second. Before I start and launch my official presentation, I have about 30 minutes. I want to take just a moment, and I'm going to ask a question. I'd like you guys, thank you, to, uh, to chime in. So Kelly and Sal, are, they're very humble and they're very gracious, aren't they? And I don't know if you remember, like two days ago or three days ago, Kelly at the very beginning said, you know, this was an idea. I didn't expect her to do this. She says, Al Byers and Dave Barnes and Sal were, at, we were sitting around on a napkin, and it was just an idea. We but had a couple of drinks. Yeah, they have some of the best ideas are breaking bread together. But it was just an idea. And how many of you all, by a show of hands, have had ideas that just kind of faded into the ether when you get an idea and it pops in your head? How many people? Yeah, a lot, a lot of us have a lot of ideas, but they never get put into action. And when I look at Kelly and Sal, I'm going to ask you one other question. They have had this idea. If I had to think of one word, indefatigable, that means inextinguishable energy, inexhaustible. These guys have stuck with this idea of integrated, integrative, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary STEM for a long, long time. So I'm going to ask you to yell out just years, 1997, 2017, and I'll let you know when I hear it, when it's right, when this first started. Because Sal's made two comments over these days about, remember when? So I want to, but we haven't said how long you all have stuck with this. So yell out some years when we think this program started. Keep going. 1994, yell louder. 2000. Two th bingo. And, 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 and that's not a seated answer. They have started this effort since 2004. That is 18 years ago. Yes, give them a round of applause. So that's all I wanted to do is recognize. They thank everybody else. We should thank them. It's been an outstanding opportunity. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. You deserve it. So um, outstanding conference. I'm going to talk to you all several minutes about, how, about this topic. But I will say, I usually, I come and I hope to contribute. I always gain much more and learn much more than I bring to the table. So I've, um, we're a conference. I was asked to submit a session. It was reviewed. There was a, a, a few volleys. So the topic I'm going to talk about is how to increase culturally relevant STEM for diverse school systems across Central Virginia. Now, I do not have the solutions. I do not have the magic bullet or the silver bullet or the answer. But I will share some examples that maybe might spark your all's curiosity in future conversations. Okay, so who is this guy in front of you all? Kelly gave a very nice, quick, brief introduction. That is me in the upper left. I was a sixth and eighth grade physical science teacher, and at that time I had a lot more up here and I had a lot less down here, and it's shifted a little bit over time. There's my uh, classroom. Uh, I taught sixth and, sixth and eighth grade. So here's another question for you. Outside of the socioeconomic status of parents, what is the second most largest, statistically significant, largest effect size, power size, variable that improves student learning? So the number one documented longitudinally over multiple studies is the socioeconomic status of the parents. They have more resources, time, they make those things available. What would be the second, and before you yell out answers, what would be the second variable? Now we've talked a lot here, right, Prue? We talked about systems. I've heard buildings, I've heard materials, I've heard non-replenishable resource time, I've heard um, technology, right, administrator support. What do you think the number one variable is that makes effect, the biggest effect in student learning? Yes, it's not hard, is it? It's the teachers. You all are the salt of the earth. You have two minutes between class, you have 20 minutes for lunch. As a middle school teacher, until you get to high school, you have to escort the students, at least at my school, down the hall to the lunchroom. You guys do an outstanding job. We are the Peace Corps of the United States, and you should feel very good about the job that you all do. So give yourself a round of applause. You deserve it. You deserve it. Okay. So um, 
NASA's in the house, I have to do this, it's just one slide, but there's another one later in the program. I was an aerospace education specialist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and that's in Greenbelt, Maryland, and I would do a lot of student programming, they called them lecture demonstrations, and a lot of teacher professional learning in the Northeast. Um, I got to visit all 10 NASA centers and design support curriculum, and I will tell you, I will back up what Daniel said the other days. You can teach any subject you want through as only NASA can. It is so inspirational, that context. I don't care if it's rocketry for force in motion or biology, uh, uh, environmental science, sustainable systems like you're learning about today. And so when I went around, sometimes as teachers, we have the pacing guide, and that's not a bad thing. It helps you pace through the curriculum, right? But sometimes, speaking for my wife, who's taught for 30 years fifth grade, the pacing guide can be so onerous that it gives no discretion to the teacher. It's like lockstep. They're trying to teacher-proof the curriculum, and you can't deviate by more than a day on what you need to teach. And so I think that when I went out, we heard feedback. NASA collects a lot of data. It's like we're not here to add more on top of an already overburdened curriculum, but how can we supplant some of the NASA resources that can help us equally and even more so, more effectively, teach the STEM topics aligned to your standards that you already need to teach. And I did get to fly in the KC-135. That plane's no longer in commission. It's affectionately called the Vomit Comet, and it lives up to its name. I can vouch for that, but um, a great experience there. So the topics I'm going to talk to you all about, I'm going to ratchet through these things. I'm going to have one about uh, state-level STEM policy, a slide on that, examples about how you might do integrative STEM at a state level. I'm going to talk about uh, materials in a partnership we have with the Virginia Department of Education. I'm going to take two grant projects, one in NOAA and one in computer science with Amazon, and talk about how we leverage corporate partnerships with the Bank of America, CarMax, Capital One. So we've talked a lot about it. I'm going to give you real examples. Now, they're not perfect, but I'll share, and you can say, oh, I, we could do that, and I'm happy to have conversations afterwards. And then finally, <clears throat> one note about communicating your message. I'm going to try to see that throughout the entire presentation. We have a lot of paperwork, don't we? All right, grades and reports, and if you're in science, you're doing the, you're doing the materials, which are replenishment of stuff, and buying equipment. If you're doing grants in universities, you're doing a lot of reports and third-party evaluations. If you're administrators, tons of reports. So the last thing we want to do, we want to spend time teaching, hands-on stuff, right, working with, working with students. We don't want to have to write about what we do. We're, we're a too humble audience. I'm going to give examples if you can, and many of you all may do this, so I'm just sharing from our perspective where it's been very effective, is to write a brief story, do a Flickr album, have, get the permission from the parents, shoot over the shoulder, you know, protect, protect anonymity and all those things. It is so powerful when you go to form corporate partnerships, when you go to push the boundaries, extend the barriers. When we're on the front line, they don't know what, we don't, they don't know what we're doing. So we have to invest a little bit of time to share that, and it will sustain the efforts when you want to um, go beyond the normal drill and kill stuff. Okay, the dean would, would, would uh, not like it if I didn't put up one slide, so I'm with Virginia Commonwealth University. I won't read those statistics to you, but more so the picture. That's downtown Richmond. The areas of the districts that I get to serve are Richmond City Public Schools, very diverse. It's in the city. I can go five minutes across that bridge in the James River, and I'm in Petersburg City Public Schools. I can go a little bit south, and I'm in Colonial Heights Public Schools. I go a little bit further south, I'm in Hopewell City Public Schools. If I go just 15 minutes outside of the capital of Virginia, down 64 East towards Norfolk and Langley, I'm in New Kent and Charles City County. So I can go to Richmond City and have tens of thousands of diverse students, and I can go 15, 20 minutes away, and along the James River, it's very agricultural, very rural. Charles City County has a total of 500 students. That's it. Two schools, K6, 7, 12. So in a very small area, I get to work with very diverse audiences, urban and rural, and high socioeconomic status and high needs. Many students, we all know that transportation is an issue, and they can't even experience environmental science at the James River and rock pools because we, we don't fund in the budgeting even to get them across the river. Okay, so the last slide before I jump into the examples, um, the Center for Innovation and in STEM Education, its goal was to leverage the assets and the resources, the, the talent pool, the human talent pool across VCU to bring high-impact, transformative STEM experiences to the highest-need students 
and the teachers who serve them in Central Virginia, and that's 15 school districts in that region. So I get to work with our medical college. I get to work with the College of Engineering, the College of Life Sciences, Humanities and Sciences. So it's not all, not all about education. We know the K-12 piece, and we partner with our subject matter experts to design these programs you're going to see about. Okay, here comes the slide about state STEM policy planning and how to communicate your message. Several years ago, this is fairly recent, um, we worked with Governor Northam, and that was a D, and now we're with uh, Youngkin, and that's an R. Doesn't matter, students don't change, right? But we said, how do we form a STEM ecosystem across the state? Now, there are other states that are ahead of us. Virginia is not in the lead, okay? But when you're behind sometimes, you can look at what other states are doing well for a STEM hub network, and you can leapfrog or learn from those mistakes, right? So five universities got together, and we got to host this at VCU, and we invited 150 leaders across the state from all the different sectors. So we had um, nonprofits and foundations. We had the district administrators. There were teacher representatives, too. We had the STEM corporations. We had the informal science centers. We had some very powerful keynotes, such as Leland Melvin right there. If you all, how many people know who Leland Melvin is? Oh, wow. So he's got some room to grow. So he was a very successful astronaut, uh, several shuttle missions, worked with the robotic arm, building the space station. He um, was the head of NASA education for a while, and now he's an independent. But he has a true heart in caring for education. So he was a, a speaker there. We had, who recognizes the white-faced, smiling gentleman? No, you can't answer, Cindy. Hang on. Besides Cindy Hasselbring, who is the white-faced person on the bottom? Any idea who that might be? It's okay if you don't. It's a, NAS, it's a DC question. That gentleman's name is Jeff Weld, and he was the senior policy advisor for K-12 education um, in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. So we brought down people that had experience at a national level working with many states and districts to inform Virginia's efforts. And you can see we had Mark Warner, our Virginia senator there. We had Chuck English, the STEM coordinator across Virginia. We launched today. We had multiple follow-up meetings, and we generated, if you all want me to share this or somehow however we do it, because there's a lot of links here. I'm not going to pull up all these links. You can, oh, awesome. So it's going to be on the website. So these are all active links that will take you right to our STEM white paper that helped form Virginia's blueprint for STEM education, how to form a spoken hub model. Um, now, here's how to communicate your message. So for VA STEM Leadership Summit, to pull off an event for a day, for 150 people, you're going to spend minimum 20, probably 30, and up to $40,000. When you have AV and food and transportation overnight for people in Northern Virginia, not in Richmond. So, you want, I'm, I'm giving you the pearls here, people. Spend three to 400 bucks to hire a professional photographer. We can all take our pictures and do social media, but to capture these pictures, that's the photographer that will generate 500 to 1,000 images and capture those moments with that gentleman smiling and the person in the foreground that's blurry, that's the head of discovery education at an international level. And there's my dean off to the side, Dr. Andrew Dare. So there, that helps, again, capturing those moments, share that story when you want to push boundaries and, and bridge partnerships later. Okay, um, here's an example of materials development and how one way to do it, not the best way, not the right way, and I'll share a, a, uh, I'll share a black eye. Um, how to target high-need students in material development for diverse audiences across Virginia. So this was Dr. James Lane. He was the commissioner at the State Department of Education, and he said um, they have a Virginia, Go Open Virginia is their open educational resource portal. It's up now. And he said, Al, we're very distributed across the state. The 10th the largest county in the country, uh, Fairfax County, God love them. I mean, they have enough resources. They can develop their own curriculum units, right? They got teams. And he goes, there's areas that are more distributed, more rural, and they don't have the, uh, the wherewithal, the time or the energy to put these things together. Can you help us develop some lessons, some 5E lessons? Yes, Dr. Lane, we can help you with that. What lessons do we develop? Data-driven, grades 5, 8, and 10. That's where we test in science. He looks at where the scores are low. You can see what content areas might, might need some help. Let's develop these units. Great. So now how are we going to do that? What do I do? Here's a partnership example. I go to the State Department of Education. I go to Ann Peterson, who is the Council of State Science Supervisors. She's the supervisor for the state. And I say, Ann, give me your best for teachers, by teachers, because they know they got their little group, right, when they do their deeper learning institutes. I said, Ann, give me 10 to 15 teachers, diverse, a mix. And I'm going to give them the 5E template. 
And then we partnered with Dr. Laurent Scott at VCU, and there is a link to something called a culturally responsive teaching innovation configuration. This is out of the um, University of Florida, and it is a heady six-page analytical rubric about how to, through the lens to look at lessons to see if they're culturally relevant. So we use that tool. So I'm thinking for you logic model people out there, you know, inputs, right, get, the, get smart people, bright people, committed people, get a good template, we know five E's, engage, explore, explain, elaborate, evaluate, extend, all that good stuff. And then we're, and we're gonna even use a great tool that's published, we got professors that are expert in it, and we're gonna have good outputs. Good inputs give you the best chance for good outputs but you always have to pilot lessons. So these lessons come off. Now, I'm not overselling these things. You're gonna find mistakes because it's made for teachers by teachers. I facilitated a process. The OER portal is derivative works with attribution. That's the Creative Commons license. So teachers can remix it and mix it up and stuff. So Dr. Scott looks at one of the lessons and there's something called the um, culturally responsive, culturally proficient continuum. Okay, this is a, also another well-known tool and it goes from culturally proficient to culturally destructive, right? So I'm thinking we might have good outputs, and when Dr. Scott says, um, Al, this one lesson is culturally destructive. And I didn't even develop them, and it stung a little, but that's, you have to have thick skin when you iterate and develop to make things better. And I said, Dr. Scott, you know, um, it's a good content topic, it's a great teacher, it's a good five E's. Why would you put it on the worst end? I don't wanna do any harm, I don't even, want, I shouldn't post the lesson, right? What is it about that? So he says, um, he's not a science expert. He doesn't even know what five E's is, but he's an expert in culturally responsive teaching practices. And he said, well, Al, and he's using this tool, he says, there's an embedded video in this lesson. It doesn't even matter which lesson I pick when you hear the story. And he says, um, it's about a five minute video, five, seven minutes of a teacher demonstrating the lesson in situ in the classroom. And what she's trying to do is f facilitate conversation. So, you know, student student discourse, uh, sense-making, talk moves type of thing. And so I don't think anybody would not raise their hand if I say, if you're trying to implement a lesson, wouldn't it make sense to be able to see a little, not an hour, but that's pretty common to see a video of the lesson being done, maybe an anonymous sample of student work. So if you don't have PD, the other teacher might have some help. Thank you for not, you know, be able to implement the lesson. But in this video, it was a diverse classroom, but it wasn't, um, the proportions of the, of the distribution of diversity were very limited. There's only two African-American, two black students there. So the teacher says, yeah, I'm looking for, tell me what we learned about, give me something on X. And the person that answered the question was an African-American student, and she didn't, he didn't have the right answer. It's not always about the right answer, we know that. But she didn't say, no, I don't believe you got that wrong. How many times have we gone over this in the classroom? I bet, I bet some of you, uh, if we're honest, I bet some of us may have heard that as we do our rounds sometimes. She didn't do that, so I didn't catch it. It wasn't that explicit. She said, thank you, but let's hear from another. I, I get you, but, and so she calls in another student, and the students gave a response. Oh, great, yes, absolutely, yes, you nailed it. Now, if you only have one or two black people in the classroom, I didn't think of this, and you're promulgating this inherent bias, this negative stereotype that if you're from a different uh, ethnicity, that you're not as smart, I don't care how good the, the talk move is, you should not put up that video. And he, so, so I think that we need to have diverse groups and use these tools to make sure, I've heard multiple times, we cater to all students. So of course that video is not in there anymore. Okay, <clears throat> increasing near peer role model support systems. Okay, I gotta prompt myself to remind myself, what am I trying to pull out of this slide? Um, this is a NOAA grant, it's called Best in Bay Watersheds and that stands for Bivow Ecosystems sustaining treasures in, uh, in our Chesapeake Bay watersheds. This is along the James River. So it's an inter-university collaboration with the Center for Environmental Sciences, uh, the Rice River Center, it's a research station on the river. We even have some NASA research going on down there. And then we have four districts uh, collaborating there. Colonial Heights uh, and Newport News are urban districts. And then as I said earlier, New Kent and Charles City are in the middle of the James River, very rural, very urban, ag-centric. <clears throat> the cool thing, about this, we all know five E's and good inquiry and hands-on. I, I think all people here, they could, re, they could recite that in their sleep with their eyes closed. The, I'm gonna give Noah a little shout out here, even with NASA in the room. This framework called a MIWI, a Meaningful Watershed Educational Experience, has some components. And there's one component that I think is unique and we should infuse when, when and how possible. And I've heard it mentioned here. 
across the days. I can't give attribution to each speaker, but I heard it, so I'll, I hope I nail it. So you identify an issue that's locally relevant and germane to where students live, right? So it's hopefully intrinsically motivating. If you're going to do hands-on, it's environmental science, you've got to get outside. I mean, that makes sense, right? You're not doing it all inside paper and pencil and whatever you're looking at, a garden or something. You have to get out and do the water quality testing. Look at the floor and fauna. And, okay, that, that makes sense. Since it's just in collusions, they do hands-on activities, but here's the part that's unique. I'm going to talk about it and play two videos to show this. So this is not me trying to sell you on it. Okay, I don't can't even take credit for it. I just had to implement it because it's part of their framework, and it was the most challenging for teachers to do. They have to design a local stewardship action project. So it's not about taking this inert knowledge and identifying an issue and then understanding the pros and cons or how we need to help the environment. Then you put it into action and you change. It's a social impact project where they live. When you can do that, and I hope you'll see that through these videos, it is transformative. And I've heard people say, Students need to share what they're doing, right? It's not about a STEM competition, it's showcasing to get feedback, okay? So here are some of the projects. Colonial Heights did a storm drain painting. Colonial Heights is a city. The Appomattox River, it runs through the city and it feeds right into the James at Colonial Heights. These kids, this is, this is 3,000 kids, four middle schools, middle school wide. They sat there and went to the city council and said, we would like to paint the storm drains and do a media campaign to inform the citizens that when you dump sewage and stuff and trash, it flows right into the Appomattox and the threatened and endangered mussels that are right there in the James River, it will kill them. And they're what keep the water clean. They're at the bottom of the food chain for a large ecosystem. You're gonna kill off a lot of animals. So I was like, doggone, that's pretty good. The next one was, um, okay, minimizing rainwater runoff. So this was New Kent County, a rural area, a lot of impervious surfaces, and it's on an incline near the river. You have some elevation differences, and there's a lot of erosion, and they wanted to stop that. So a, does, that, that first idea sounds like a big stretch for me, an aspirational goal, but they pulled it off. But these other people, they just said, you know what? Why don't we just have rain barrels, collect the rain that's pouring off, don't let it run off the, the asphalt, you know, roll out the mud, and we'll use that to water our, our gardens to grow our own food for sustainability and planet. And I was like, cool, that works. And then I'll highlight one more. Um, Upriver, you have fresh water and you got mussels. <clears throat> they clean the water. Downriver, you have uh, brackish water and salt water near the Chesapeake Bay, Norfolk area, you got salt water and you got oysters. That is a huge industry, huge in Virginia. It's like 40 to 60 million dollars. And based on the salinity levels, um, you have different flavors. It's kind of I didn't know this, but I, I learned it. It's like 40 to 60 million a year. So now, how do you balance the commercialism where you harvest oysters when you harvest ha engineering design? Really, I'm not going to go into the depth, but there's lessons. How you harvest, how long you harvest, over what period of, of duration. And then you have sanctuaries where you try to protect the oysters. You know, and they, they, they don't get harvested at all. But guess what? When you have droughts and that brackish water level, you don't have a lot of water coming down and the brackish water level moves up. Remember, water flows from high elevation to low. So when it rains a lot, it keeps the brackish water line further downstream. We had some droughts in Virginia. That brackish water line came up and it devastated some of the oyster commercialism uh, sites. They, they call it aquaculture, like agriculture. And so the watermen were soliciting the regulators at the state. This is real, the State Department of Education going, we want to harvest these sanctuaries. So there is real audio, real transcripts. So we're designing curriculum that say, why don't you let students assume the roles of the regulator, the waterman, the consumer, and they, they learn the science as they engender that role and kind of debate on how do you measure those things and offset one another. So they made oyster spat cages. Okay, cool, they're making cages. <clears throat> I mean, this is simplistic elegance. So they partner with high school. Guess what high schools need to do? Because my daughter did it. Many high schools have a community service hours you gotta do, and they get their driver's license. So what do they gotta do when they drive? They gotta have hours driving. So guess what? Do you know how they grow, how they recycle these oysters? The restaurants have their shells. I can't be the only person that knows this. And they dump these shells out, but first just throw them away. The students that have to get hours in community service anyway pick up the oyster shells and they take them to William & Mary, Vims Marine Institute, they take them to VC Rice River Center and the oyster shells, I had to learn all this, guys, I'm astrophysics, physics. I don't mind learning, I didn't know anything. I misspelled muscle. Dr. James Bonish, in writing the grant for this to Noah, I'm going a little off track here, but I'll show that I'm humble. He goes, Al, you know, they gave me all these URLs, 
about ecosystem stuff and videos to watch. And I'm right, but I know how to write PD and stuff like that. And so he goes, I like where you're going with this, Al, but the muscles you're describing are on our body, not in the water. Because Spellcheck didn't catch one S versus two S's. Yeah, that's how dumb I was. But, but we're doing good work, aren't we? We can all learn. So anyway, um, you get the substrate of the oyster, and they put these little spat things on it. And when they grow to a certain size, they put them in like these 40-pound bags. You take them out on a boat. You dump them over to the sanctuaries, and you're replenishing and sustaining that oyster. So these are, there's some, this stuff is... Very deep learning, aligned to Virginia standards, grades six and seven for my environmental science. And I hope I didn't miss, oh, oh my gosh, please go back one, because now you get to watch videos. I get to be quiet for a little bit. The first video, let me set it up real quick. The first video, okay, whew, trying to get it all in here. At NSTA, I was there a lot of years, we managed large national STEM competitions, tens of thousands, 40 to 50,000 students. Army East Cyber Mission, Toshiba Explorer Vision. 2,700 judges, outstanding, you know, STEM competitions. Guess what happens of those 42,000? It's all good because you can learn it at every level, but it's a pyramid. Only like 50 come to DC for a week. And guess what they get to do? They get to present at the National Press Club they interact with their U.S. senators in the Reagan building. They're on panels when the senators come in. And when you're from that state, that senator or congressman comes down and they're taking photo ops. It is a transformative. It's some experience that goes, wow, it builds that confidence and that confidence. I can do this. Look at this, right? But guess what? You all know this. And it, we're all working on it. There's not much diversity for those 50 students when they show up. And so how do we structure experiences that can bridge them in and scaffold and support their efforts so that they can thrive. <clears throat> so keep me on my time, Kelly, before you play the video. So my daughter, I'm gonna try to do my bet. Five minutes? Oh God, okay. So my daughter is a junior in high school and she, I, she wants to do digital video editing. I said, you gotta get some technology, do something. She joins the Technology Student Association, a shout out for ITEEA Sister Association for Students. 40 plus competitions, national. I've judged at the national with Steve Barbado. Wonderful stuff. CO2 cars, solar cars, digital video editing, speaking, ton of stuff. She comes home. She says, hey, Dad, I went to the TSA meeting, and I'm co-president. I said, are you kidding me? She's quiet. There's only like 10 kids in the club, all right? So we're not, let's, let's keep it real. So she has to do a regional competition because that's how it feeds up, right? I know the competitions. I've seen them. I go, well, which one did you pick? She says, I did the balsa wood airplane with like a rubber band. I don't know if you've seen it, but you know, it's pretty simple. It's a balsa wood kit you order, rubber band, a plane, and they get a big cavernous auditorium and the plane takes off and it flies. This is the plug for TSA ITEA. It's good stuff. It kind of flies in a circle if you torque the wing right. And it flies up and as it gets to the ceiling, the rubber band loses its, its elasticity and it unwinds and it right, kind of comes down. All they do is time it. And the longer ones, when they fly longer. So I drop her off in Henrico County at the Magnet STEM School at 10 o'clock. She's gonna compete at 12. I'm not gonna sit around for two hours for the line and all that. So I go get a cup of coffee. I come back at 12, I go, Wendy, are you up? You know, she's with her team, she's co-president. She says, we're not gonna fly. We're not gonna compete. I go, what do you mean? It doesn't even take off the ground, Dad. It only turns, she said, I won't even get emotional. It's not, it's terrible. So something that's supposed to be positive can have a negative consequence, unintended deleterious consequences, if we don't scaffold and support the students we're trying to reach, right? So I thought, why can't I, here comes the video, two videos, I'll try to wind this up, why can't I take that national project for only 50 students and provide that for 3,000 students with representative teams at the Virginia State Capitol where they can share what they've done with their stewardship projects? These are some powerful learning tips. So now, Thank you. In the back, the wonderful AV team. Can you play that first video? This is them at the Virginia Legislature getting recognized with a proclamation after they've met with their legislative representatives and the Agricultural Committee in, at Virginia Capitol. These are things you all can do. Four districts, five teams, stream live. Thank season. you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise for an introduction. Delegate McQuain, you have the floor. Thank you. Madam Speaker and members of uh, the House, <clears throat> it is my sincere pleasure and honor to recognize a group of students 
and teachers from across our Commonwealth who are making a positive difference in their environmental communities along the James River. Oh, Thank you, Madam Speaker. Welcome to the VCU Bay Watershed Project students, both middle school and VCU students. And uh, it's a very impressive program. I hope this has been a great experience for you. And thank you for what you're doing for our ecosystem. Welcome. So what you're seeing is as they've gone around to the legislative representatives with this infographic poster board and talking to the people that represent their district, this can turn into funds for projects. Those kids and that energy in those faces, they make a difference. So you're seeing something to the end, and they're sitting in the back in the gallery. And on that applause, I had a professor come to me. He was, he was not this one. I won't call anybody out. The, another one said, you know, Al, I thought this was a waste of time. What, you know, it takes a lot to do a field trip type of thing. No, when those students get that feedback from somebody of stature like that, priceless. So now, a three-minute video, here's the example. I'm going to set it up. NSF, this is a resource for you all. I would go to this site. NSF funds, Turk manages it in Massachusetts. It's called the STEM for All Video Showcase. And every year, they have a multiplex now across multiple years. If you have a federally funded grant, you can submit a three-minute video. And all the PIs and whomever, it's open, can read the, you know, watch the video, and then you have discussion. And all of these projects, you can get a lot of ideas and see the contact people in little three-minute clips of integrative STEM approaches. There's hundreds of them up there. So I'm trying to practice what I preach. I said, let's show people what we're doing. I did this on iMovie myself, so don't shoot the production quality. It's just pictures, but please roll that video as well. And this will show what this overall project is. The K-12 frameworks for science education suggest deeper learning occurs as students explore phenomena that is relevant to their daily lives. When kids ask their own driving questions and design investigations to answer those questions, they are intrinsically motivated. Deeper understanding occurs as students engage in hands-on science practices using their own data as evidence to support their claims through student discourse. NOAA education efforts support a learning approach called a MIWI, a meaningful watershed educational experience that engages students in a similar manner. MIWIs charge students to implement a local stewardship action project derived from an environmental issue informed by their field study. Many would agree these approaches spark student curiosity, but are easier said than done. And our NOAA grant will share how we support middle school teachers working with urban and rural audiences along the James River, developing authentic storylines relevant to issues challenging bivalve ecosystems provides a compelling narrative for students to showcase their action projects at the Virginia State Capitol. Our effort is a collaboration between the VCU School of Education, the VCU Center for Environmental Studies, the VCU Rice River Center, and the Harrison Lake National Fish Hatchery. We planned with our partner school districts in Charles City, Colonial Heights, New Kent, and Newport News, Virginia. Teacher professional learning supported the application of NOAA lessons and the MIWI. Content knowledge from the VCU environmental scientist and hands-on lessons from VCU School of Education ensured a student-driven approach to learning. Storyline themes include threatened, endangered, and invasive species and sustaining oyster and mussel ecosystems, providing experiences that increase teacher competence and confidence through content knowledge first-hand experience conducting field studies ensured effective translation for the classroom. To sustain the effort, VCU graduate students and education experts made on-site school visits. We provided an online community platform, transportation funds, and many grants to remove implementation barriers. The teachers did a tremendous job implementing the environmental student lessons. Student field studies collected data on water quality for later analysis to determine their action projects. Projects have not been completed yet, but are being planned across the following areas. Students shared infographics of their efforts today at the Capitol. Scheduling student teams to meet with their representatives took careful planning, but the payoff was tremendous. Student learning that moves beyond the classroom, out into the environment, is powerful and authentic. Couple that to a local issue addressed through action and having their projects recognized by their representatives, priceless. You could stop it there. 
So um, I, I drew it a little deeper in that one. Let me, I'm, I probably have one minute now, so I'm gonna fly through this. This is a grant funded from Amazon, uh, managed by uh, administration by the uh, Virginia Department of Ed. And we're taking NSF lessons um, in computer science and we're augmenting them, aligning them to Virginia standards and then through another tool, through cultural responsive teaching, and we'll be posting them at the OER in December. And the component I'll drill into um, student Innovation Series, we partnered with Bank of America, Capital One, and CarMax. And um, so I've heard people talk about this, so here's an example of that. <clears throat> and we took um, real world challenges that they have developed, and we have, uh, they have real problems, and they give feedback to the students. But we also talk about multiple meetings over Zoom with uh, career trajectories. And we have different, here you have five school systems there. We partner with CoVA, which is a regional uh, computer science magnet. And they came up with the challenges, but they also meet with the students and talk about what their college and career pathways are, what their personal story and trajectories are. They talk about the importance of social media, about their profiles, because kids can screw it up early, and they're not gonna get any internship or get hired for certain things they post. So they. They don't hear from me, they hear from the people that got the jobs. And here's some examples. Um, car, has anybody bought a car from CarMax? No, oh, come on, really? I won't. So I bought three, they're headquartered at Richmond. They literally move millions of cars around the country. And you can get a car, like Carvana, you can get a car delivered to you for free within 100 miles. You can spend a grand from California, but it's not refundable. So how can you get these cars where they need to be? Millions of cars, not exaggerating, across the country in the most efficient manner. Uh, trains and, and the, the, the uh, trucks and stuff like that. Capital One, if you look at their challenge, very relevant. How can you use data and technology to get a better picture of a family's spending needs and how it aligns with their needs versus wants? So kind of just in time, just enough, just for me, electronic performance support systems. Banks are everywhere, right? Capital One's a credit card. And finally, they're coming to pull me off the stage. Bank of America had a good project as well. There's an image of the speakers that we have working with the kids. Here's a picture of the Zoom images with the children. Um, so I can close. This is the last project I'd like to highlight since NASA's here. They're not going to pull me off the stage with NASA here. So, um, so we worked with two NASA centers, uh, NASA Langley and NASA Wallops. We're very fortunate. <clears throat> NASA is all over the country with, with universities, with contractors. I know there's like, I need, how many people work at NASA's civil servants in the back table there, roughly? Anybody? Yeah. How many work at, the, at NASA? Civil servant. 34,000. Yeah, I, I was three or 4,000. Oh, I got you. Well, okay, I heard a number like 22,000 across all the centers, but with contractors. And it's even broader when you have those subcontracts out in the states and things. So, so they do make a huge impact, but there's only 10 NASA centers across the country, and Virginia has two centers. So we went to both centers, and we said, and we worked with one, two, three, four school districts, and we went with the science, you all, we went with the science specialist and the science supervisors, and we said, what areas do you want to have professional learning in? And they had to agree, and NASA joined in these planning meetings. The NASA didn't make new content, they got a ton of content, but they configured the response and did, it, we we're gonna be face to face, and then we went into COVID, so we did it online. And here's some screen captures of that. Um, they did an outstanding job working together, and I'll close with one story about technology that I'm done, so you're gonna feel comfortable about this. Um, so NSTA, we, we, early on, now there's too many webinars. You can't even attend them all. But when it first came out, we were using that technology with NASA and NOAA and FDA and National Academies. <clears throat> and you all have been in them for PD, and usually what you do is you mark up a slide, you answer a poll question, you watch a video, right? And you have some slides. So I got to work with Sally Ride. Does anybody know who Sally Ride is? Astronaut, the first female astronaut in America, right? So Sally Ride, she's not with us anymore, but Sally Ride Science. And she, this is when Mars, it used to be called Moon, Mars, and Beyond. It was the theme. And this is when the Pathfinder had just gotten to Mars for the first time. Do you guys remember that? Am I old enough? Jay Leno, they were on Jay Leno. It's, yeah. So Sally Ride says, Al, I want to do something with Mars. Let's take this picnic table, this three by five, you know, a regular fold-out table, and it looks like the Martian surface. And what I want to do is have these little rovers, and I want to take teachers nationally across the country, put them in breakout groups on the web. They haven't met each other before. I want them to code the instructions, and then we're going to up, we're going to give us the instructions, 
We're going to upload them into the rover. I'm going to point the webcam at this picnic table, and we're going to download the instructions. And she had a flag to get the destination to do the, re and she had a concentric circle. We're going to do that. And I looked at her, and I said, man, I, I, you have to be really cool work with Nancy. I can't. She was like a hero, but I said, well, Sally, uh, you know, how you doing? Um, let's think about this a little bit. And there's a lot of areas where they don't know each other. You want to code. You want to upload. You're trying to. <clears throat> and she goes, no, let's go for it, Al. I said, okay. So guess what? I'm telling you that technology, there's a lot of eye candy out there. If you know the affordances of technology and how to use it effectively, these teachers were in breakout groups. They came up with some code. They uploaded these little rovers. And when that little rover got to that, hit that spot, cheers were erupting through like this. It wasn't Zoom, but like the Zoom channel. She came to me afterwards, and she said, you know, Al, I didn't think it was going to work, but I wanted to push the boundaries and try it. And I said, well, Sally, I, didn't, I wasn't sure either. And then the third wall broke, and I said, can I get a selfie? You know, I mean, I got, you know you're here. So anyway, that's it for me. Thank you for the extra time. There's a lot of resources if you need them.